Good evening. Great to see all of you. Thanks for coming tonight. This is our, our second midweek Lenten service. And in our midweek services this, this spring, we're going to talk about symbols of God's love. We're going to look at different symbols, different things that come up in the, the Holy Week account of Jesus and talk about what each one of them means for us. Tonight we're going to think about the 30 silver coins that Judas received when he betrayed Jesus. May God bless us as we, we meditate on his word tonight. We'll begin by singing our opening song. It's the hymn, Glory Be to Jesus. Lent is a time of repentance, so it's good for us to confess our sins. We continue on, on page three. Our help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and of one another. I confess to God Almighty, before the whole company of heaven and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned in thought, word, and deed by my fault, by my own fault, by my own grievous fault. Wherefore, I pray God Almighty to have mercy on me, forgive me all my sins, and bring me to everlasting life. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you pardon, forgiveness, and remission of all your sins. Amen. Amen. One custom in Christian churches during the Lenten season is to read through the, the whole story of Jesus' suffering and death. Sometimes that's called the passion reading. Passion is another word for suffering. We're going to do that in the, tonight in the next four Wednesday Lenten services. This year we're going to read the story of Jesus' sufferings and death from the Gospel of Matthew. And so, between the five Wednesdays, we'll end up reading three chapters of Matthew describing what Jesus has done for us. Instead of just me standing up here and reading it all, notice that you get to participate. 
And instead of making it easy, you know, just going back and forth, different people have to participate at different times. And that makes me have a break, and it makes you pay attention, which is really good when we're listening to God's Word. So we'll read this together. Note the different parts and, and read when it's, when it's your turn. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, As you know, the Passover is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they plotted to arrest Jesus in some sly way and kill him. When Jesus was in Bethany in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. I tell you the truth, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. So they counted out for him 30 silver coins. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says, Your success, my appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. While they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. Jesus replied, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Jesus answered, Yes, it is you. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new cup, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus told them, This very night you will all fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. This is God's word. Joy, and singing our next song, my song is Love Unknown. Like we've been doing on these Wednesday nights, we're going to sing it along to a video made by Koine. If you've noticed, Koine likes to take old songs and put new instrumentation to them and to try to revive the singing of some some well-known older songs in the church. 
And so we'll join them in singing, My song is Lava Nun. Love to me, love to the loveless, shown that they might lovely be. Oh, who am I that for my sake my Lord should take frail flesh and die? to bestow but such disdain so few that longed for Christ would know but oh my friend my friend indeed who at my need his life did spend Sometimes they strew his way And his sweet praises sing Resounding all the day Hosannas to their King Then crucify is all their breath And for his death they thirst my Lord done what makes this rage and spite he made the lame to run he gave the blind their sight sweet injuries yet they had these themselves displeased and against him right Dear friends in Jesus, 
How much is Jesus worth? Sounds like a foolish question, right? How could you possibly put a value on Jesus' life? And not just for Jesus. We know the Bible says every single human life is a precious gift from God. How can you say how much money or stuff or property is equal to a human life, right? It sounds like a foolish question. How much is Jesus worth? Except in the Bible, there was actually a value that was added to Jesus' life. There was a specific number that was given for what Jesus' life was worth. We heard it as we read our Passion reading earlier in Matthew chapter 26. It says, Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him thirty pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. So how much was Jesus worth? 30 pieces of silver. I told you that each week during Lent, we're going to talk about one of these objects that you hear about in the Holy Week story. Tonight, it's 30 pieces of silver. Jesus was worth 30 pieces of silver. So how much was that? This is one of the things that makes the Bible hard to understand. They didn't actually use American dollars back then. I'm not sure why. It's sometimes difficult to, to figure out what, what, what money are they talking about. There's 30 pieces of silver. Is that a lot or a little? Whenever you don't understand something in the Bible, what's the first thing you should do? Uh -huh. <laughs> Ask your pastor is the second thing. Google it is the third thing, actually. The first thing you should do is see what the rest of the Bible says. Because usually the Bible answers our questions if we actually know what the full Bible says instead of just looking at one passage. And that phrase, 30 pieces of silver, it actually shows up in other places in the Bible that help us understand whether this was a, a big value or a small value. And one place you see 30 pieces of silver is way back in the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 21. In the times of Moses, this is what we hear. If the bull... Gore is a male or female slave. The owner must pay 30 shekels of silver to the master of the slave, and the bull is to be stoned to death. Not a real happy verse from the Bible. In ancient times, slavery was a real thing. It was a reality in the world. And so there were laws that governed slavery, and there were laws that had to do with what if I'm responsible for the death of of a slave of another person. And if I or my bull ends up taking the life of a slave of somebody else, what do I need to pay him? 30 pieces of silver. And so 30 pieces of silver, that's actually the price for a slave. And so when Judas is willing to give up Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, what was he saying Jesus was worth to him? That Jesus, you're, you're worth about as much as the lowliest person on earth. I'd happily give you up for the price of a slave. Did you ever realize that before? 30 pieces of silver? So with Judas, there's this irony that Judas was a disciple of Jesus. He walked around his whole life saying, Jesus is worth it. Jesus is worth giving up my job. Jesus is worth letting my family spend a lot of time on their own. Jesus is worth following him for three years. Je Judas, with his, with his words, kept saying, Jesus is worth it. But the reality is, at the end of the day, to Judas, Jesus wasn't worth it. Jesus was worthless. And we even saw that in the rest of our, our Passion reading tonight. Did you hear the little part about Jesus being at somebody's house and a woman comes with an expensive jar of perfume and she breaks the jar and pours that expensive perfume on Jesus' feet and it was her showing, her, showing Jesus how much he was worth to her. And what did Judas say? Oh, what a waste. What a waste. Right? Jesus isn't worth it. To Judas, Jesus was worthless. So how about to you? How much is Jesus worth to you. 
And all of us want to say back, well, Jesus is worth it, right? He's worth a lot. Look at Pastor, we're even here on a Wednesday night. I mean, who comes on a Wednesday night? We're like the best of the best, right? Jesus is worth it. But remember, Judas said that too, right? Judas said that for three years. And yet in his heart, Jesus was really worthless. So I think God's calling on us tonight to examine our lives and say, how much is Jesus really worth? With Judas, there was this problem of money. Is Jesus to you worth more than money? Are you willing to give up $30 or whatever that amount is in your offerings to God? I can remember one man coming up to me and saying, Pastor, go ahead, you can preach anything you want from the Bible, just don't touch my wallet. <laughs> and what was he saying? Well, Jesus isn't, isn't worth it. Not my money. How about your time? I really am glad that you took the time tonight to come here to church. But how often do you have to make a choice in your life? Baseball game, Jesus. Fun event with family, Jesus. Time in God's word or that favorite television show and which one do you choose? Is Jesus worth it? Or do our actions too often say Jesus is, is worthless? Last couple of Sundays in our sermons from Colossians, we've gotten to the point in the book where it talks about getting rid of sin in our lives as a result of, of God's grace to us. We heard verses like, put to death whatever belongs to your sinful nature and rid yourselves of anger and rage and malice. Remember some of these things? Every day we have a chance to show how much Jesus is worth when it comes to those sins and temptations in our lives. Do you choose that sin? Or do you choose Jesus? Is he worth it? Or do our actions actually say that Jesus is worthless? You know, it's an easy thing in the Holy Week account to, to, to really rag on Judas, right? How could he do this? How could he possibly give up Jesus just for a little bit of money? And you know, I know, because we've done the same thing, haven't we? We've said with our mouths, Jesus, you're worth it. And yet with our actions, it's looked like Jesus is, is worthless. I really don't like that word, worthless. Maybe because sometimes that's how I feel too. And I bet sometimes that's how you feel. And feeling worthless is one of the, the worst feelings in life, isn't it? Right? For kids, maybe it's you're at recess and nobody wants to play with you. It doesn't seem like a big deal, but how does it make you feel inside? Worthless. Maybe it's at your job, you feel like you're expendable. Everything would be just fine without you and you could say it's just a job, but how does it make you feel inside? Worthless. Maybe it's been in relationships, a lot of us have been rejected by somebody else, maybe a boyfriend or girlfriend, even a spouse, maybe it's children or parents and when somebody else rejects you, it doesn't matter how many other people love you, how do you feel? Worthless. And on top of that, there's all of our sins. The devil, he reminds us of all the things we've done, right? And that guilt and those regrets, they, they take over your heart. And how do you feel? Worthless. And the worst part is, it's actually true. There's a verse in the Bible that says, even all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Without Jesus, the very best things that we do, what are they? They're worthless. So we're so often worthless people who call our Savior worthless. Now go home with a smile on your face. Thankfully, Judas wasn't the only one who put a value on somebody else. As Judas put that value of 30 silver coins on Jesus, there was somebody else putting a value on people too. And that was Jesus himself. Do you know how much Jesus values you? There's one more verse I put for you in your bulletin. It's from 1 Peter chapter 1. It says, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, 
but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. It wasn't just the Pharisees who paid something for somebody during Holy Week. Jesus paid something too. What did Jesus pay? Not 30 silver coins. He paid with his, his life. He paid with his blood. And who did he pay that for? For you and for me and for every other person in the world. Isn't that amazing? Especially when you remember that Jesus is actually God, right? He's God and man at the same time. Think of, think of how much you're worth to Jesus. Jesus was willing to give up everything he had in heaven and come down to this world just for you. This past Sunday we heard about Jesus going in the desert and being tempted for 40 days by the devil and he went through all that for you. For 33 years he was tempted every single day to sin with all those pleasures that we so often give in to and how many times did Jesus give in? Not a single time. For you and then he went to the cross when he gave his body and blood for the forgiveness of the sins of the world, who did he do that for? He did that for you. I know there's these voices in your head that say, oh, you're worthless. But Jesus looks you in the eye and do you know what Jesus says? He says, you're worth it. You're worth it. I love the way that Martin Luther describes that in the catechism. Remember catechism class? You should. It's an important thing. In catechism, we encourage students to memorize Martin Luther's words describing the commandments, the Apostles' Creed, and some words that have always stood out in my mind is how Martin Luther explained the second article of the Apostles' Creed. That's the part that talks about Jesus. And there's a part in there where it says, He redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death. Aren't those powerful words? It's what Peter's telling us in the Bible. Jesus has redeemed you. He's bought you, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood, with his innocent suffering and death. When you see the cross, hear Jesus say to you, you're worth it. Even if it's not what you hear from anybody else, right? Maybe the other kids at school, they look at you and they say, oh, you're worthless. Jesus looks you in the eye and he says, no, that's not true. You're worth it. Maybe at work, you really are expendable, right? Maybe your job isn't going to last that long, but Jesus, he looks you in the eye and he says, you're worth it. Maybe your heart has been broken. Maybe it'll be broken again. But no, it will never be by Jesus because he looks you in the eye and he says, you're worth it. And all those sins that weigh us down, that pull on our hearts, that make us think to yourself, I'm worthless. Jesus says, I took those away. He looks you in the eye and he says, you're worth it. And it makes us come back to the question we started with. So how much is Jesus worth? You know what you're worth to him, right? You're worth everything. You're worth his life and his death, everything. So how much is Jesus worth to you? How can we not answer in the same way, right? Money, time, it's nothing. Compare with Jesus. Jesus is the one who takes us from worthless to worth it. Amen. Let's say a prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, just like Judas, we often say that you're worth it with our mouths, but that's not what we show with our lives. Each day we have the chance to choose you or something else, and too often we choose another thing. We make it seem sometimes like you're, you're worthless. And yet even as Judas was betraying you, you were walking to the cross to give your body and blood for Judas for the rest of the world and for us. When you died on the cross, you shouted out to every one of us, you're, you're worth it. Dear Lord Jesus, overwhelm us with your grace to us and use that grace to help us to see how you are worth it too. Whether it's our money, whether it's our time, our talents, our lives, 
Help them to give, help us to give them to you because you are worth it. In your name we pray. Amen. We have a number of additional people to keep in our prayers tonight. We're going to say a prayer for two men we've been praying for, Dwight Meyer and Steve Vaughn. They're still recovering from different injuries they've had. New on our prayer list is Tom Temple. I shouldn't say new on our prayer list. He's been on our prayer list quite a bit. But he's back in the hospital again with pneumonia. So we'll say a prayer for Tom Temple. Last night I was able to go to, to the Little Rock, Arkansas area again. And you know we're trying to start a new Lutheran church there. And so we met with, with six Wells Lutherans in that big city. And we talked about one day maybe having a church there. So let's pray that God would bless those mission efforts there. And then uh, my family's been facing a, a sad thing. My, my niece, who's a freshman in college, has suddenly been hospitalized with some debilitating disease that no one knows exactly what it is. She's in a hospital bed and can't move or speak or anything. And so we'll say a prayer also for my niece, that God would be with her. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, when we see Jesus willing to give his life on the cross, there, there should be no doubt in our minds that you love us and nothing can separate us from you. We want to pray for a number of people facing difficult situations. We pray for Steve Vaughn and for Dwight Meyer who continue to recover from injuries. We're thankful that they seem to be headed in the right direction. Bless the doctors and nurses caring for them. We would ask that one day soon they're, they're able to, to go back home to their, their houses. We pray for Tom Temple. Lord, Tom's been through a lot and he's back in the hospital again. Pray that you beat back the pneumonia that's in his lungs. Bless the doctors and nurses as they care for him. Give him a strong faith in you. And when it's your will, please restore him back to health. We pray for my niece, Ellie, who's been hospitalized. Lord, even the doctors aren't sure exactly what's going on. It's surprising that a young woman would have to go through this. We pray that you allow the doctors to find out exactly what's happening that there would be a way to treat it and that you'd allow her to, to have good health again, to go back to school and to her family, be with her family and give them strength in this difficult time. Finally, Lord, it's a blessing to have a Christian church where we can gather to hear your word and worship you. We pray for this small group in the Little Rock area. We pray, Lord, that with time, you'd allow this group to also have a pastor and to, to build and to grow a church there. Please be with our wells, Wisconsin Synod Churches, in Oklahoma, in the United States, and around the world. Give us pastors who lead us and faithfully teach your word. And give every one of us a, a mission-minded heart that looks to share your gospel with the people around us. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We'll close by singing one more song. It's a song that's in the new blue hymnal. We've been practicing it a little bit, but it fits perfectly with what we talked about tonight. It's the song, My Worth is Not in What I Own. I will not bore
Trust in Him, no one. 